There are few events in the world that when they happen and we experience them or hear of them, we will never forget where we were. I remember where I was when the Blue Jays won their second World Series, right here in Kingston, celebrating downtown. I remember where I was on 9-11, when Yitzhak Rabin was shot, and when Lady Diana was in that fatal car crash. News of Queen Elizabeth's death is one of those moments as well. Not that I was doing anything particularly notable, just sitting at my desk doing some work, but it is and was a memorable moment that will be forever cemented in my mind. The Queen and I were not particularly close. <laughs> I never met her, though her picture hung in my classroom every year from kindergarten all through high school. She was always there, watching me, watching over all of us. She monitored my spending habits. After all, she was there on every penny that I ever spent. Her messages of hope and blessing at holidays, New Year's, and other important occasions were always there in the background. And even though I rarely thought about the Queen or the royal family, somehow she was a constant, taken for granted, unchanging. So perhaps it wasn't so odd that when I heard the news of her death, my heart skipped a beat. I felt emotional, somewhat surprisingly, I thought. My eyes welled up with tears. It was a shock that she was gone. I mean, nobody lives forever, and she had many years behind her, so it wasn't a shock in the sense that I couldn't believe it was possible, but it was a shock to the system. That one constant, unchangeable, steady, reliable presence was now gone. Maybe you can relate. My emotional response surprised me. So I've been thinking about it ever since and trying to understand where it came from and what it means. Many pundits are talking about how Queen Elizabeth devoted her life to service, how she was eventually an agent of change in the monarchy, but that's not it, not for me anyway. They've pointed out how she was everyone's mum or grandmum, maybe, but I have my own mum and grandmums with whom I have and had actual real relationships, and I don't think the Queen was particularly warm and cuddly. <laughs> So, what is it? Well, looking to Jewish tradition, we have several images of royalty. One refers to God, the, others, the other to Shabbat. Probably most obvious, especially at this time of year, is the image of Avinu Malkenu, our father, our king, as a metaphor and image of God. Because of its over overly male-gendered language, our machzor, our high holiday prayer book, doesn't translate those words at all, just leaves it avinu malkenu. The image is one of dualities, of the close parent and the distant monarch, the parent who rules with love and mercy, and the ruler who advances justice and wields power over its subjects. Both images work together, simultaneously drawing us near and holding us at a respectful distance. Our rabbis taught, if you use the left hand to push away, let the right hand bring near. With the images of parent and monarch, we have a picture of a God who loves us but also judges us from a distance, who sees us as who we are but also pushes us to change to meet our full potential. We need to see God as one who loves and nurtures, rules and judges. Thus, God's attributes of deen, justice, and rachamim, mercy, are encompassed in one divine being. They balance each other. Am I saying that the queen is like God? No. And yes. In the ancient Near East, there was something known as the divine right of kings. It means that kings are believed to be put there by God. And in fact, they are gods, all powerful and all known. Anything beneficial was said to belong to the king. Think the King James Bible. It was attributed to the king, even though he had no part in writing or translating it, but it was his, or think Queen's University. The king had total power over their subjects. They literally held the power of life and death in their hands. Not so for the kings of Israel. In our tradition, God begrudgingly gives the people a king because they beg for one. 
But the king is still subject to the king of kings, the Holy One. The Israelite king is subject to the rule of God and must actually write his own copy of the Torah and keep it with him at all times. This is our people's innovation. Nobody is equal to God. Queen Elizabeth was not a god, but perhaps her steady, constant, reliable presence was akin to God's, a comfort, an authority, a distant ruler. Her presence represented concretely what God is in the abstract. In fact, our liturgists and poets made this connection between the manifestation of the divine presence and royalty, specifically feminine royalty. We have two images in our Kabbalat Shabbat prayers that play off and interact with one another. The Shabbat bride in L'Chad Odi and the Shabbat queen, Shabbat Hamalka. First, we sing the beautiful poem prayer written by Chaim Nachman Bialik, which reads, the sun on the treetops no longer is seen. Come, let us welcome Shabbat, the true queen. Behold her descending, the holy, the blessed, and with her God's angels of peace and of rest. Come now, dear queen, with us abide. Come now, come now, Shabbat, our bride. Shalom Aleichem, angels of peace. It's better in Hebrew. And then, after a few more psalms and songs, we greet Shabbat as a bride with L'cha Dodi. We sing, L'cha Dodi likrat kala pene Shabbat ne kabala. Beloved, come, let us greet the Shabbat bride. These words were written by the Sfat mystic Shlomo Alkabetz somewhere around the year 1535. Though the word queen doesn't appear in the refrain, the translators of our prayer book, Sim Shalom, that we use every week, felt it was implied and translated it as, come my beloved with chorus of praise, welcome Shabbat the bride, queen of our days. And at the end of this classic hymn, it is customary to stand just as one does when royalty enters the room. We turn towards the entrance and with a bow, we welcome her to our midst. The Shabbat is our queen because we are overjoyed and awed by her presence. We anticipate her arrival every week as we clean, cook, and prepare. We put on our Shabbat best, as it were. So too for the bride, we anticipate weddings with great excitement, get our hair done, find a nice dress or suit, maybe even a tuxedo. With the queen, though, there are rules. Where to stand, how to bow or curtsy, not to walk in front of her, how to address her, and in the movies I learned, first as your majesty and later as ma'am, pronounced as mum. When she stands, you stand. When she sits, you sit. Many rules, just like Shabbat. But with the bride, we hug her and kiss her. We talk with her. We may even dance with her, just like Shabbat. Shabbat has both aspects to it, the formal and the informal, the distant and the nearby, the transcendent and the imminent. So to our image of Avinu Malkenu, distant and near, the close loving parent, and the distant king ruling from afar. The queen was not, is not, God. But what she symbolized was divine. In our country, the monarchy symbolizes power, even though it does not actually wield any. The governor general is the queen's, now king's, representative here, and is appointed to carry on the government of Canada in the king's name, performing the constitutional and ceremonial duties of the sovereign. She summons parliament, reading the speech from the throne, and in the sovereign's absence, prorogues and dissolves parliament. The governor general also grants royal assent in the king's name, which makes a bill into a law, but also has the ability to withhold the king's assent, thus disallowing the bill and annulling the law. Because this role is symbolic in nature, this has never happened in modern times. The queen is not, was not, God but she symbolized divine power. And in truth, symbolic power is real power. Because it turns out, we keep the symbols of her power around because something within us needs it. The roots are ancient. They go all the way back to the Israelites in the book of Samuel, begging for a king. We knew that king wouldn't be God, but we wanted the symbols of God here with us in a concrete form. We are concrete people. 
As much as we want to convince ourselves and others that we don't need the concrete, that we can rise above it, still existing in a world of abstraction and metaphor is hard. Every once in a while, we need something solid, concrete, real, to drive the message home, to make it feel real. It isn't enough to know that our partner loves us. We need to, them to show us in concrete ways, whatever your lang love, la love language is. Actions, words of affirmation, gifts, quality time, or a physical touch. <laughs> it isn't enough to know it's the day of rest. We need to actually do the resting. Unplug. Don't return calls or messages. Spend time doing the things we want to do, not the things we have to do. It isn't enough to think about wishing someone a happy birthday because they know I mean to wish them well. We need to actually reach out and say the words or send a card or even a text message. It isn't enough to think about apologizing to someone for having hurt them since they really know that we're sorry. I mean, how can they not, right? We have a history together. They know me and I'm not that kind of person. No, we actually have to say the words. Judaism is a ritual religion. Ritual is the idea or belief actualized in an action. We might think that we fully grasp the idea, but until we experience the ritual associated with it, I contend, it doesn't fully sink in. It's something that can't necessarily be put into words, but when you've experienced it, you know it. We can imagine throwing breadcrumbs into the lake to symbolize the casting off of our sins, and we might think, okay, I get it, I don't need to go down there to the lake and do it, but when you do, it feels different. It's suddenly real and cleansing in a way that maybe you couldn't imagine. When I speak to engaged couples leading up to their weddings, I often ask them what they think will be different after the wedding ceremony. Most are living together and have, not, and have been a couple for several years. They usually contend that nothing is going to change. Everything will be the same the day after the wedding. Checking in with them afterwards, to a person, they say that they were wrong. That ritual was powerful and transformative. It made them a family. It was emotional and real, and maybe it even brought God into the equation. Judaism is full of rituals, and that's what keeps our tradition relevant and real. From birth to death, celebrating a new child, their coming of age, weddings, funerals with Shiva, Shloshim, and reciting Kaddish daily, observing Yisker four times a year. These rituals are powerful and help us transition from one life situation to another. Other rituals occur weekly and yearly. Shabbat candle lighting brings us a sense of peace and we could, as we see the flames dancing. Hearing the shofar every year stirs something deep within our souls, wakes us up and renews us and reconnects us to the community, to our tradition and to the divine. Fasting on Yom Kippur cannot be imagined, but the experience of it, if we are able and permitted to do it, is a powerful deprivation that allows us and forces us to focus on what's really important. We have so many holidays, I could go on and on, but you get the idea. Each ritual serves a purpose of making the metaphorical concrete, making the abstract real. And that is what the queen did for me, I suppose. She was a symbol of power and control for the good of the people. She was a symbol of love of her people and her country, a constant presence, unchanging and dignified. She was an ideal. Her death is a wake-up call, for me at least, to take notice more clearly of God's presence in my life, despite not being able to see God or have a concrete interaction with God. God is present and visible in our world and in our lives, but we need to be the ones to reach out and make ourselves aware of it. Through ritual and prayer, we make God's presence concrete and real. Every year we get such a wake-up call. God forbid it should come in the form of a notable death. Rather, thankfully, we have the wake-up call of the shofar. Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Berdachev explained it this way. 
A king once set out on a journey that led him deep into a thick forest. At one point, he lost his way and could not determine how to get out. A group of villagers passed by, so he asked them for directions back to the palace. But they did not recognize him, so they did not know if they should help him or not. And moreover, they didn't know the way to the palace. Eventually, someone passed by who did recognize that this was the king and who did know the way to the palace. So he escorted the king back home. The king was so impressed with the person's knowledge that he made him his personal advisor. A long time after this, the advisor wronged the king in some way, and in his anger, the king told his ministers to judge the advisor and declare him guilty of rebellion. The advisor was very upset because he knew what this meant, so he asked the king for one last request, that they both dress themselves in the clothes they wore when they had their first encounter in the forest. The king agreed, and when he put on the clothes he wore then, he remembered at once the tremendous favor the advisor had done him by leading him out of such a hopeless situation. In his gratitude, the king forgave the advisor of his misdeed and returned him to his post. Similarly, each year, we perform the ritual of returning and reenacting our initial encounter with God when God gave us the Torah at Mount Sinai amid shofar blasts. We have this concrete ritual of sounding the shofar to remind God of the day when we first met at Mount Sinai and to remind us of the importance of that gift of Torah and to seek forgiveness. This concrete reminder helps us reconnect yearly with God to remind ourselves of the special nature, the royal and regal nature of our joint purpose here in this world. May we continue to revere those noble entities in our world, both human and divine. May we find opportunities to make the abstract concrete, to bring holiness into our lives and draw nearer to God, the King of Kings, the ruler of rulers. May our sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II, rest in peace and may God save the King. Amen.